I want to sincerely thank the State Bar Foundation and its officers and trustees for honoring me this year with the State Bar Foundation Founders Award. I also want to thank my firm, Miller Canfield, including CEO Mike McGee and other firm leaders for indulging me in my passion to work to make a consequential difference in our society, including in the delivery of civil legal services to the poor and underserved in communities in our state. I'm truly humbled by this award, given the remarkable accomplishments of past recipients, including Linda Rexer, who for so long and so successfully championed civil legal services in our state and in our nation. I'm inspired by Linda's work and by the work of those who have been so honored in the past and humbled to be now included on this distinguished list. My passion for promoting legal assistance to the underserved in our community is inspired by the ethical obligation described so well by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in addressing the Pro Bono Institute several years ago when she said, lawyers have a license to practice law, a monopoly on certain services, but for that privilege and status, lawyers have an obligation to provide legal services to those without the wherewithal to pay, to respond to needs outside themselves, to help repair tears in their communities. As a member of the bar, we are so blessed not only in terms of financial means, but also in terms of our knowledge and ability to effectively transform our society. In the same vein, I recall the Winston Churchill quote, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. I am also reminded of the Boy Scout mantra that we were always to leave our campsite cleaner than when we arrived. These thoughts inform my view of our obligation to promote legal services to the struggling members of our community. So my fellow members of the bar, within your firms and within your communities, I urge you to take up this ethical obligation to support legal services for the disadvantaged. I urge you to get involved with local legal aid organizations as a volunteer. More importantly, I urge you to generously support the Access to Justice campaign this year and every year. Our time is valuable, but in terms of expanding legal services to the poor, I think our money is more valuable. The men and women who work for the various legal aid organizations are the true champions in the delivery of civil justice. My fellow honoree, Larray S.C. Brown, is a fine exemplar of such a civil justice warrior. They are underpaid and overworked and assist thousands of clients every year. And yet there is still tremendous unmet need for legal services, for veterans, for domestic abuse victims, for those with housing and benefits challenges, and so many other legal complications which are like ankle weights on our struggling fellow citizens. I would ask you and your firms and your legal departments to reach a little deeper in your pockets and be generous with the Access to Justice campaign. Your money makes a dramatic difference. Again, my sincere thanks to the State Bar Foundation for this humbling recognition. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's truly an honor to receive this award tonight. This evening is one that I can guarantee you I will never ever forget and it will be the highlight of my professional career. Before I go any further I'd like to give a shout out to my dad. After all he's the reason I became a lawyer. He was always a proponent of the state bar. At one point he was the chairman of the negligence council and always so proud of his affiliation with members of the bar. He'd come home and tell stories about his trips that he had and I'm sure there's stories about some of the lawyers still in this room. And I can guarantee you he's looking down on us today, wishing he was sitting with you having a drink, celebrating his son's award. I also want to give a shout out to my longtime mentor, Ron Wagner. You know, I remember sitting as a young lawyer in the early 80s when I was moving from Saginaw to Detroit to practice with Kitsch looking at my father, wondering if, if I was making the right move, wondering if I was ever going to receive the type of generous mentoring that my father gave me with his, he's such a tremendous role model and father figure. Shortly after arriving at Kitch, I was assigned, I had the privilege of being assigned to Ron Wagner. I say privilege because 
he was such a fine mentor, so generous with his time, such a great father figure, and role model in his own right. I'm truly blessed to know that he has been in my corner all this time. I know that I would not be receiving this award today but for his tutelage. Thank you so much, Ron. This honor is particularly humbling when I look at the, all of the past recipients. This, this list here is truly the who's who of med mal litigation. These are the folks that I practiced battling with for 40 years, day in, day out. Had the privilege to battle with. And now to be mentioned in the same breath with them is truly an honor. You know, it's interesting, as I go through the list of the folks and the, the past recipients, uh, it brings back memories of my cases with them, and now I'm beginning to realize what I miss the most about the practice of law. I just stroke about a year ago and prevents me from practicing. People ask me, what do I truly miss about the practice? I usually say the battle. Well, now I'm going to say the camaraderie. I miss practicing with the people on that list and my partners. I realize now I'll be blessed if, God willing, I'm back in the, in the trenches with all of you. If not, that's okay. There's a hell of a way to go out. Thank you so very much. Good night. It is ironic that in a system where we strive for justice for our clients, I'm an appellate attorney where most frequently my services are required because a trial court has denied my client a trial by jury. Now I spend a lot of my time defending constitutional rights of parents in custody and child welfare proceedings. Nonetheless, civil rights and civil justice are both principles in which I believe, and these principles are the ones so fervently pursued by my colleagues from the Michigan Association for Justice. I also value civility, and so I am deeply honored to receive this Respected Advocate Award from the Michigan Defense Trial Council. To me, this award embodies the civility that attorneys from these two respected organizations have for each other and for the judicial process. While members of the Michigan Association for Justice and Michigan Defense Trial Council work hard to represent their clients and vigorously advocate for their interest, we understand that we better serve our clients by being civil to each other, both inside and outside the courtroom, by representing our clients with integrity, and by respecting the judicial process and appealing when we don't agree with the result. And these behaviors and attitudes serve all of our clients, whether it is an injured person or an insurance defense company. It also benefits our society and helps to elevate the reputation of attorneys. It does seem a little unfair that I would receive this award when as an appellate attorney, it is so easy to be civil to opposing counsel, as my appellate colleagues on both sides of the V are consummate professionals. It is with great honor that I accept this award, which has been bestowed upon many wonderful advocates for civil justice and civil rights, who also embodied the idea that civility was the way of achieving results for their clients and society including some of my own personal heroes in the law, such as my friend, Bill Kritzelis, one of the hardest working judges on the Court of Appeals, Lisa Gleischer, and my compatriot and teacher of auto law, George Sinus. To be put in the same class as these great attorneys is humbling to say the least. Thank you for this award, and I look forward to seeing you in the appellate courts. Good evening, my brothers and my sisters. Let me begin by saying thank you to the State Bar of Michigan for bestowing this honor on the Urban League of West Michigan. When it comes to carrying out the work of the League, we try and adhere to the wisdom of author and theologian C.S. Lewis, who said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. 
So to receive this honor is quite humbling indeed. I would also like to thank my dear friend and colleague Dale Iverson for nominating us for this recognition. Dale has long been a co-laborer in the work of creating equitable opportunities and outcomes for all people, especially those who have been historically marginalized. I use the word labor because at the end of the day, advocating for justice and equity is work. And sometimes in life, you get an opportunity, to, an opportunity to engage in work that also serves as your passion and your calling. Well, my brothers and sisters, allow me to confess that I'm working diligently to become a historian. My beloved wife, Jessie, might say that I'm addicted, seeing that every other day I'm getting a book or two in the mail, and the topic always seems to point to history. I'm a firm believer that history is indeed our best teacher, and therefore, the more we know about the past, the better we can be prepared for the future. One of the foremost leaders of the civil rights movement happened to be Whitney M. Young, former president of the National Urban League. Whitney said, every man is our brother, and every man's burden is our own. Where poverty exists, all are poorer. Where hate flourishes, all are corrupted. Where injustice reigns, all are unequal. Where injustice reigns, all are unequal. History has taught us that inequality is real and pervasive, as is inequity. So how can we as a society lean in and engage in the work of creating a more perfect union? How can we collectively fix the crack, or shall I say cracks in our society that have allowed so many to fall through? Many of you here probably know that the Liberty Bell was a flawed instrument. It contained a crack. There is widespread disagreement about when the first crack appeared on the bell. Apparently, hairline cracks on bells were bored out to prevent expansion. However, it is agreed that the final expansion of the crack, which rendered the bell unringable, was on George Washington's birthday in 1846. According to historians, the bell gave out clear notes and loud and appeared to be in excellent condition until noon on that day when it received a sort of compound fracture in a zigzag direction through one of its sides, which put it completely out of tune and left it a mere wreck of what it was. After the device of civil war, Americans sought a symbol of unity. The flag became one such symbol and the Liberty Bell another. To help heal the wounds of the war, the Liberty Bell would travel across the country. Starting in the 1880s, the bell traveled to cities throughout the land proclaiming liberty and inspiring the cause of freedom. A replica of the Liberty Bell forged in 1915 was used to promote women's suffrage. It traveled the country with its clapper chained to its side, silent until women won the right to vote. On September 25, 1920, it was brought to Independence Hall and rung in ceremonies celebrating the ratification of the 19th Amendment. To this day, oppressed groups come to Philadelphia to give voice to their plight at the Liberty Bell, proclaiming their call for liberty. My brothers and sisters, please join me today in being like that old Liberty Bell, although fractured and imperfect, still able to make a sound. May that sound be your voices, promoting justice, equity, inclusion, and equal opportunity for those who have been historically marginalized, the oppressed of our community, because of the color of their skin, their socioeconomic status, and quite often their zip code. So join your Urban League of West Michigan in promoting the idea of letting freedom ring throughout our beloved cities, state, country and world because without justice we can have no peace again thank you for this honor and may god bless you
This year, the Women Lawyers Association of Michigan proudly celebrated its 100th anniversary. The organization was started by five women in Detroit in 1919, before women had the right to vote. These women started the organization to advance the interest of women lawyers and promote a fraternal spirit among lawyers. As the number of women lawyers grew and women began practicing outside of the city of Detroit, regional chapters were established throughout the state. Over the years, there have been 18 different regions of the Women Lawyers Association. Each of these regions has offered leadership opportunities to women lawyers. The Women Lawyers Association of Michigan started its foundation in 1983. The foundation's mission is to support education of women who show leadership in advancing the position of women in society. Since 1997, the WLAM Foundation has awarded over $600,000 in scholarships for outstanding women law students at Michigan's law schools, and 252 women law students have benefited from these scholarships. In the past 100 years, the Women Lawyers Association has provided leadership opportunities to over 350 women who have led the state board, one of the 18 regional chapters, or the foundation. No other organization in the entire state of Michigan has done that for women. The Women Lawyers Association of Michigan is also a strong advocate for promoting improvements in the administration of justice and promoting equality and social justice for all people. For example, the Women Lawyers Association has been a strong partner in the Michigan Equal Pay Coalition. We've opposed efforts to limit access to justice by immigration enforcement that deters victims and witnesses of crimes from coming to court. We've worked with a number of courts to create lactation rooms for women who are breastfeeding. We're continually urging the governor to appoint judges who will increase the diversity in our judiciary. We've opposed discrimination on the basis of sex and sexual orientation. We've supported efforts to protect young women from sexual assault and dating violence. The Women Lawyers Association of Michigan is especially honored to receive this award because it bears the name of Kimberly Cahill. Kim Cahill was an ardent supporter of the organization, serving as president of the Women Lawyers Association of Michigan and as the treasurer of the foundation. Though I never had the honor of meeting Kim, one of her friends recently described her as wicked smart, wicked funny, and utterly dependable as a friend and colleague. We hope that the organization has lived up to everything that Kim espoused. And we certainly strive as members of WLAM to all be utterly dependable as friends and colleagues, just as Kim was. Every region, every leader, and every member of WLAM is grateful to the State Bar of Michigan for this honor. And we all look forward to 100 more years of serving our communities. I want to thank the State Bar Pro Bono Initiative and the Board of Commissioners for this award. However, the regular staff of Elder Law of Michigan, otherwise known as ELM, really deserves the award. I only volunteer 5 to 10 hours per week, which is not really much of a burden because I am retired. Day after day, the staff helps seniors and the disabled with their civil legal problems. Many of the staff make financial and personal sacrifices to work there. Our clients are often vulnerable and have limited access to legal services. The staff provides advice on the phone, written legal information, and referrals to other agencies for more help. The ELM staff helps on a variety of legal issues including debt, landlord-tenant, mortgages, public benefits, insurance, warranties, guardianship, and many more. ELM has been providing these services since 1990. ELM deserves the award and the overall support of the State Bar. Thank you. I am so honored and humbled by this award. Champion of Justice has such a nice ring to it. 
But as I've reflected on it, I've realized that being a champion of justice is actually something of an occupational hazard because championing justice is part of our job description as lawyers. It's what we signed up to do when we made that fateful decision back in the day to go to law school and join this profession. We live in a world of such injustice, a world of incredible inequality between those who have and those who don't, a world in which people are demonized because of where they were born or what God they worship, a world in which the color of your skin and the size of your wallet too often determines how you are treated and what your opportunities are in life. And as lawyers, it is our job to fight that injustice. We aren't alone in that fight. The law is just one tool for justice. As lawyers, we must work in partnership with and as allies to the communities we serve because they too are fighting for justice, just with other tools. Still, the law is an incredibly powerful and important tool. Time and again, we have seen how the law, the courts, and the Constitution are both the first line of defense against injustice and the last resort of those who are oppressed. The problem is that for most people, the law and the justice you can get through the law is pretty inaccessible. I think of my job as being a translator. The law is a profession where we speak for others, where we use the fancy words and the convoluted doctrines of the law to turn the facts of our clients' lives into an argument that will win in the courtroom. When we fight for justice, what we are doing is translating human pain and suffering into legalese. It's our job to give voice to people's stories in a foreign language, the language of the law. A couple of months ago, I had dinner with Sam Hamama, a client, now a friend, whom the government is trying to deport to Iraq, a country he left in 1974. In June of 2017, Immigration and Customs Enforcement suddenly rounded up Iraqis, including Sam, intending to deport 1,400 people to Iraq, even though they are likely to be persecuted, tortured, or killed there. Literally hundreds of lawyers across the country came together to try to save their lives. Together, we translated the desperation of families being ripped apart and of refugees being shipped off to torture. We translated that into an emergency nationwide injunction preventing removal so that the immigration courts now have time to review the hundreds of cases that Sam and others were able to file. That night, eating pasta with Sam, who was the lead plaintiff in that litigation, I so viscerally felt the transformative power of the law. He was there in that moment, surrounded by his wife and his four beautiful children, rather than being dead in Iraq, because of the law, because of the courts, and because of the Constitution. My other emotion that evening was gratitude for the hundreds of lawyers who came together as legal first responders in that emergency last summer. But for that nationwide team of attorneys, I would not have been eating dinner with Sam and his family. But for those attorneys, hundreds of other Iraqi families would not have been eating together at other dinner tables around Michigan and around the country that night. Sam's case is not over and whether his children grow up with a father will depend on what happens next in court. And of course his case and the cases of the 1400 other Iraqis he represents are just one drop in a vast sea of injustice. Which is why we all need to do our jobs and be champions of justice. If there's anything I've learned, it's that justice is a team sport. I'm so grateful to be on that team. Thank you very much for this honor and now Let's all go and do our jobs. Good evening, all. I'm so very grateful to receive the 2018 Champion of Justice Award. I'd like to thank the State Bar of Michigan and the awards committee members for this most prestigious honor. I'd also like to thank Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy for her nomination of me. 
as well as all of my past and present colleagues in the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office for their dedication and support throughout my career there. It's quite an amazing office and I feel very fortunate to be a part of it. As a new assistant prosecutor years ago and several times since, I've been asked to take an oath of office. In addition to committing to uphold the Constitution and the laws of this state, there's an affirmation at the end of the oath to see that justice is done in each and every case that I undertake. I believe that by offering diversion opportunities to deserving youth who enter our delinquency system, I'm helping to fulfill that commitment to see that justice is done. There's a fundamental philosophy within the juvenile justice system that emphasizes rehabilitation over retribution. This philosophy recognizes that juveniles, by virtue of their age and immaturity, sometimes make impulsive and poor choices that can have consequences affecting their future. The availability of targeted diversion for first-time offenders of minor delinquent acts can give these young people a second chance. It allows them the choice to accept responsibility and make amends for their delinquent conduct in return for an agreement by us to forego formal prosecution. If the diversion program is successfully completed, those juveniles can move forward without the stigma of a delinquency record negatively impacting their future. In simple terms, it's a win-win. And I believe it's the type of justice that both the Prosecutor's Oath and the Champion of Justice Award speak to. I'd like to take the time to thank both my wife and mom for their incredible support of me over the years. Lastly, I would like to most especially thank my dad, Jim Heimbuck, an accomplished attorney and State Bar member for more than 50 years my dad has always instilled in me the importance of hard work, integrity, and fairness. I couldn't have asked for a better role model and cheerleader during my career as a public servant. Thanks, Dad. Love you. I am honored to be this year's recipient of the award named after one of my legal heroes, John Reed. As a young lawyer uh, in my early 30s, leaving private practice to join the legal academic community, I viewed Professor Reed, who I knew as a law student at the University of Michigan, as setting the highest standard a law professor should aspire to meet. He was a gentleman, highly competent, eloquent, the quintessential professional who projected a reverence for high ethical standards. I wanted to become a lawyer because it was the only profession that had the oversight for the operation of our legal system and therefore the responsibility for the pursuit of justice within that system. I was filled with idealism as I believe most of my brothers and sister lawyers were when entering law school who are sitting in this room this evening. I started my academic career at the University of Detroit School of Law in 1975 right after Watergate, when some of the best and brightest lawyers ended up going to prison and losing their law licenses. The first course I was assigned to teach was professional responsibility, a new academic discipline at that time that was required to be part of the law school curriculum by the American Bar Association after Watergate in the recognition that law schools had a responsibility to teach ethical issues to future lawyers. Shortly thereafter, I was appointed by the Michigan Supreme Court to be a member of the newly created Michigan Attorney Grievance Commission. That experience led me to appreciate the need for law students to understand and be sensitive to the unequal nature of the lawyer-client relationship and the importance of giving fidelity to our fiduciary responsibilities. I learned from John Reed that part of being a good law professor was being a good role model for law students in always showing up on time for class, being prepared, 
treating the students in a fair and courteous manner, and stressing the importance of proper ethical conduct. I also concentrated my legal research and writing in law review articles and books in covering suggestions for appropriate ethics rules and improvements in our lawyer disciplinary system. As an independent producer for public television, my desire has been to help the public appreciate the complicated and important role for lawyers in our democracy and to profile some lawyers who fought for justice in civil rights cases. Lastly, I have enjoyed my participation in many State Bar of Michigan committees, including the 1988 Task Force on Professionalism, the Standing Committee on Grievance, the Task Force on Procedural Disciplinary Rules, and the Lawyers and Justice, Judges Assistance Program. My sincere thanks to the State Bar of Michigan for honoring me and the memory of Professor John Reed with this award.